release the spirit of praise in this nation. We release the spirit of praise. We praise Jesus. We exalt Jesus. Jesus Christ, the exalted King, the risen Savior. Woo! Yes, Lord. <laughs> yeah, let's go again. Another wave, another wave, another wave, another wave. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ Almighty, we give you praise and glory to your name. We love you. We love you. We love you. Woo! That's what opens portals of glory, ladies. <laughs> Woo! Amen. You can be seated. I have someone very, very special to introduce to you right now, Stacy Campbell. Um, Stacy and her husband Wesley are actually my pastors um, in our um, um, apostolic center back in Canada, in Kelowna, British Columbia. Um, Wesley and Stacy oversee and pastor all the itinerant ministries. And I think there's about 12 or 13 of us, global itinerant ministries that, that uh, uh, serve the Lord outside of that center. And, um, and so we're a team together, and uh, Stacy and Wesley take care of us, cover us, pastor us, and bless us. And they are revivalists. And they go all over the world, prophesying revival, teaching on it, declaring it, getting the whole world praying the Bible and and um, and exalting Jesus. And you're going to enjoy Stacy Campbell. How many of you have never sat under Stacy's ministry or been acquainted with Stacy's ministry? Oh, you're in for a treat. You need to know that she is a sign and a wonder. And. <laughs> Time will reveal what that means, I, I know, but in uh, 1987, um, her and Wesley and a bunch of other uh, leaders in the church were visited by the Holy Spirit's power. The Holy Spirit came upon Stacy at that time. You know, they were all just a bunch of Baptists and didn't know much about the gifts of the Spirit. I don't know if they knew anything about the gifts of the Spirit. They didn't know anything about the prophetic gift for today. But when the Holy Spirit came in power, he came upon Stacy in such a magnitude of, of blessing and anointing as well as other leaders in the church. And they just started being radically shaken by the power of God, prophesied for days and days and weeks and months and are still prophesying. And so um, uh, we're just so blessed to see what God has done through Stacy, Wesley and their team. And uh, so let's give them a welcome. Let's give her a welcome. <laughs> I can see that people are taller in Pensacola than in Canada. And um, I, was, I was actually sitting down in the front row and wondering what I was going to do about this great big pulpit. And I thought, well, maybe I could go up here. And, uh, but then I thought, well, there's all these flowers here, and I might knock some over. So, and then, then, then Pat came up to introduce me. And uh, so I was a little bit odd. I always feel a little bit uh, self-conscious when I stand next to Pat. But in some ways, it's very strange that I'm here because I am probably, actually, I was kind of laughing to myself yesterday. I will stand up here because I can hardly see some of you at the back. Uh, <laughs> and um, I, I became, I was actually raised in the, in the Catholic Church. And I became a Christian when I was 16 years old in a Plymouth Brethren Church. Now, how many of you know what a Plymouth Brethren Church is? Now, Plymouth Brethren, the women wear head coverings. And they actually started the doctrine of dispensationalism, which means that they believed, like it was a Brethren guy that believed that the gifts of the Holy Spirit had all passed away. And my husband used to take John MacArthur's sermons and preach them out verbatim about why the gifts of the Spirit are not, are, are not for today. And I remember when I was 16 and 17, you know, I had a couple friends that were Pentecostals and going to their church, and, and you guys scared me. <laughs> I, I remember one time, everybody started speaking in tongues at the same time, and the hair on my arms just went, and I could feel like, doo -doo 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 -doo, someone's in here, you know, and I thought, oh, I don't know what that is, and you know, if it can't be the Holy Spirit, which what we were taught, it had to be another spirit, and so I just would like flee out of there, but now, I scare you. And so, and so that's pretty good. 
And I had no ambition, and I, I was just thinking how ironic it was that here I am in front of this great, big, huge, enormous pulpit and speaking on Awake Deborah. Because I was taught that women didn't do anything in ministry, except cook. And I hate cooking. In fact, I, I just hate cooking. Do I have an amen? Sisters, do I have an amen? Because, you know, I, I have five kids. And um, my, my oldest son turned 16 yesterday. And um, they all wanted different food. You know, and then my husband liked a certain food. And then the kids would not like, he likes spicy food because he's traveled a lot. And my kids would like, you know, bland food. And so if I made my husband happy, the kids would cry. And if I made the kids happy, my husband would whine. And so it was just like one of those things that I could never feel like I ever made anybody happy. And then it would make a big mess. It was just so much work. And I hated cooking. And then I read this book, you know, by Brother Lawrence. And he would say, I flipped my little omelets in the pan for the love of God. And I just went, what is that? How did, how did, you, how did you get there? He was one of these old saints, you know. And, and I just thought, I, I, I don't even understand that. I realize there's levels of sanctification that I have yet to hit. <laughs> but, but I have a really good friend. And her name is Donna Petch. And she's the worship pastor's wife at our church. She's one of the worship leaders. And so... What happened is one day when my kids were all small, Donna Petch took me to another level of ministry because she came by without telling me she was coming. <laughs> and I was actually homeschooling my kids at the time and, you know, I had some in diapers and some that were being, you know, toilet trained and some, you know, that were past that but just old enough to make a mess and not old enough to clean it up. And so uh, she came by and I remember distinctly the day she arrived at the door and didn't tell me she was coming and I remember she opened the door and said Stacy hi I just happened to be in the neighborhood and I took one look at her and I opened it just to crack and I looked behind me and I thought of closing the door but instead I knew at that moment you know we were talking about honesty the first service so I, 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 had a, I had this choice in my heart and I thought what am I going to do what am I going to do what am I going to do and finally I just flung open the door and I said, come on in. It is my ministry to make other women feel better about themselves. <laughs> and so she, you know, made her way over all of the books on the floor. And we cleaned a spot off the counter to make coffee. And we sat down in the middle of, you know, the kids, the toddlers running with diapers and no clothes. And, and we sat down in the middle and we had the best cup of coffee, I'm telling you. And Donna said, I like this ministry. She said, I'm going to take up this ministry. And so the next time somebody came over to her house and it was a total mess, she flung wide the door and said, come on in. It's my ministry to make other women feel better about themselves. Besides, if you think this is bad, you should see Stacy's house. So, anyway. But uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be, we, we planted our church about 16 and a half years ago as a Baptist church, actually. We started as Baptists, and the Holy Spirit, Spirit hit us, you know, um, uh, and I, you know, I was at a Baptist seminary after university, and so it was a very, you know, I am kind of an anomaly, really, because I'm sort of ex viewed as being really extreme on one side, and actually I was extreme on the other side, so uh, it's uh, uh, just... The way, the, how mysterious are the ways of God? That's what William Carey said after a fire burnt down his life's work. He looked at the smoldering flames, you know, 20 some years or more of Bible translation. A fire burnt down all, all of his translation. He almost had the New Testament finished. And he goes, how mysterious are the ways of God? And then he went on to do a better version after that. You know, and sometimes God uses just the, foolish things of this world or the things that we think are downfalls, God actually takes them and uses them because really it's all about Him. Um, I want to introduce you to some of our uh, products because we really believe in this, this, these products. It's not like a passing fad for us. This is a, a life message that both my, both my husband and I carry on praying the Bible. Uh, I believe that the only way to relationship with God is through prayer. And so uh, we have developed a series of uh, uh, 
you know, books. We have Praying the Bible, the Book of Prayers. We have another book, Praying the Bible, the Pathway to Spirituality, some cassette series on it. And then some um, CDs that if you don't know how to pray the Bible, all of our CDs model uh, praying praying the Word of God. And so that's kind of the form that we take, not just, not, uh, it, there's many different types of Bible, prayer in the Bible, intercession, petition, etc. But ours is praying God's Word back to Him. And when you pray the Word of God, you will be praying the fullest revelation that we have of who God is. And you will begin to discover who He is as you meditate on His law day and night. And so I'll be um, playing uh, one of the tracks of that at the end. It's a, uh, actually, it's a prophetic word the Lord gave me off of uh, Extreme Disciples and just give you a little sample of that. But I wanted to introduce um, Jennifer Miller. Could she come up here, please? By the way, I, I, it's such an honor to be here with Pat. Pat Cocking is one of the finest Christians I've ever met. You know, you see a lot of people, even Beverly was talking this morning about what they're like on stage. Well, I see Pat off the stage. And everywhere I go, this is what I tell everybody. Pat Cocking is one of the finest Christians I have ever met. I mean, she's way better than me. She actually, you know, walks in the fruit of the Spirit almost, at, you know, at all time. I've never seen somebody walk with as much fruit of the Spirit almost ever. She's just amazing to me. So when I grow up, I'm going to be like Pat. <laughs> oh, this is Jennifer Miller. I've asked her. She's flown right all the way in from Kenya. And uh, you notice that we've been talking about the generations. We had three generations with Beverly. We have, um, you know, uh, something that God is doing in this day and age, and we will not be able to do it separate from one another. And I have asked Jennifer to come here to begin to share what God is doing in her life. Jennifer is 22, 23. She just turned 23. And um, she is an amazing woman of God, an amazing woman of God. And uh, I've asked her to kind of give a little brief testimony of what God's doing with her uh, in Africa. Um, before I share that, I just wanted to share quickly, um, just to tie kind of what um, Beverly was sharing this morning about um, being broken and being emptied out. And um, I had actually a vision about two years ago, and the Lord showed me, um, I was in this room, this room of intimacy. It was in the Father's house, and there's all these different rooms. And in this room, it was beautiful intimacy, and um, I noticed that there was a, a small door that took me to another room if I chose to go to that room. And in this vision, I said, okay, Lord, I want to go. And I said, what's down there? And the Lord said, that's the weeping room. And I said, the weeping room? Of all the, the things in your beautiful house, why a weeping room so connected to the intimacy room? And the Lord said, there's very few people who ever go down there. And I said, Lord, why is it right next? I mean, the door was right next to the bed. And I said, Lord, why is it there? And he said, that's where I spend most of my time. I said, okay, Lord, I want to go. And so the Lord took me down in that room, and then I realized why very few went down there. You had to get very, very low to get in. And in fact, you had to even get on your knees just to fit through the door. And when you get, got in there, you could just feel the heart of God. Like there was a small window in the room, and the Lord just sat on this, this chair, and he looked out the window, and there were just millions of faces and, and cries and, and children, and every, every form of injustice, the Lord could see it all. And he just sat there and he wept. And he heard it all. And from that place, I realized that, that connecting that room, there was another door. And it led to, to a room called the strategy room. And I said, I want to go in the strategy room. Because I knew, I couldn't see behind that door, but I knew in that room was worldwide revival strategy for the church. Power, signs, wonders, everything we need. And I said, I want to go in there. And the Lord said, you don't fit through that door. And I was so offended. I was like, what do you mean I don't fit through the door? And he said, you're too big. And I said, wow. And then I had an instant understanding that, you know, we cry out for revival. We cry out for, for God's spirit to come. And for, you know, we want to see the signs and the wonders and all that. And that's totally accessible. Completely, 100% accessible for every single person. But the only way is very few want to leave the intimacy room and actually come down to the weeping room. And that's the only way into the strategy room. There is no other way to the strategy room. And um, I just wanted to share that picture with you, just to kind of pound in what she was sharing this morning, because I really believe that's what God is speaking to us, is to move into that place where we say, okay, Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing to shed off everything. Let it, let it all hang out. Let you work in all my stuff and just be broken and empty so that you can lead me into that strategy room. And guaranteed, you'll fit eventually through that door. 
and be released into those things. Um, just briefly, I just want to share um, what's happening around the world, really, with children um, in revival. And basically, um, well, just about two hours ago, I stepped off the plane, um, which is coming from Kenya. So if I'm not coherent, I've been flying now for about 48 hours. Um, but what God is doing is really, really exciting. And um, we took basically several children, um, started with just a few, and just began to, God really gave me a clear mandate to disciple these children, to preach to them an undiluted gospel. And to be quite honest, I didn't even know what that meant. I thought, do I even know an undiluted gospel? And so I had to relearn. I mean, I've been raised in the church, but I, I had to relearn the gospel. And in doing so, you know, I felt so inadequate getting out. I was, I was 21 at the time, dropped off in the middle of the desert where we just came from 52 degrees Celsius, like horrific conditions, and getting out there all by myself, and I felt so totally inadequate. Like, how do you face AIDS and poverty and disease and all these things? You know, you feel inadequate. And I was just crying to the Lord, and I said, Lord, I feel so inadequate. And he said, exactly. You are inadequate. And in fact, it's your inadequacy that makes you, that, that's your greatest strength. So stay inadequate. And I was like, okay, Lord. So in that place, I've ha having no answers, knowing no idea what to do, um, began to cry out to God. And God began to, just sitting down in the dirt with three or four little street kids, just starting to preach to these little dirty, drugged up, little street kids, an undiluted gospel, as best as I could. And pretty soon it grew and grew and grew. And then this summer we, we trained um, 600 children in the community. And we taught them an undiluted gospel. And then we released them. Because you can't go and empower children and not make a place for them. That's not biblical. So we really believe in mentoring and discipling and unto releasing. So um, we did that, and after we, we discipled these kids, we had a children's crusade where these children did all of the preaching, all of the ministry, all of the leading the worship. They ministered to the sick, cast out demons, um, tiny children. And these kids, we took them into the hospitals, and they went, you know, every ward praying for the sick. And we saw, I mean, I'm telling you, with our own eyes, multiple AIDS patients, tuberculosis, malaria, typhoid, you name it wiped out of the hospital and praise God in fact um, just this last week I was there doing some follow-up I'm actually I live up in Kelowna British Columbia um, part of Pat and Stacy's church um, just this last week we were doing some follow-up and I was just four days ago in the hospital and we went to all the different hospitals in town now, one of the hospitals, because after the kids were so excited seeing all the miracles, because you see, when we told them God heals the sick, we didn't, we didn't add on anything else, you know? <laughs> like we do kind of here sometimes, right? And if he doesn't, <laughs> maybe, no, it was God heals the sick, go heal the sick. The kingdom of God is inside of you. You know, so what? You're broken, you're messed up, you know? They love God. They believe it. They take him at his word. And so they go and they do it. And... Um, <clears throat> one hospital, the kids were going every day on their lunch break and um, after the crusade and were continuing to minister. So many people have been healed, the whole hospital has now completely shut down. They cannot stay in business. They cannot stay in business. And we've got the doctors and the nurses coming to work in children's ministry because they have no job. It's very exciting. Another hospital says since the, since the children have been in there, they're, this is a hospital. There has not been one single death since August when we had the crusade. August. And just so much that God is doing through these children. And um, it's, it's now exploding. You know, we've got an invitation now into Sudan this summer to train 5,000 kids. Children who are ready to be martyred. You know, and I'm telling you this because, you see, the gospel is so simple. And if God can use a broken child who believes, surely he can use us. So I want to just challenge you with that and encourage you that no matter what, where you're at, what's going on, it's so accessible. The strategy room is so accessible for every single one of us because we're all children. And he's got so much for us and God is pouring out like never before in this day. And he's just looking for one who believes. So praise God. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I forgot. Um, 
Actually, another one of the things we just did this week was really fun. Um, we've got this one area where it's just very known for drug lords and there's a whole underground movement going on. It's totally evil. Um, lots of violence and gangs and drugs and whatever happening. And um, basically, for years, nobody's been able to, to catch this group. They're kind of like an underground mafia, you know? Nobody can catch this group. Nobody can bring this thing down. And, um, you know, the church began to hit a wall, like, what's the deal? We're praying, we're praying, like, what, what is going to break this open? And so we said, you know what? Let's send in the kids. So that's what we did. We, um, we just sent in a team of our kids, and they marched through the desert for an hour to get into this place, and we told them, you go undercover, like, you know, we fully prepped them. Like, I mean, they're walking right into Satan's territory. And we said, you just go and worship. That's it. Go and exalt Jesus there. And they'd been taught Psalms 8 too. God has ordained praise on their lips to silence the enemy. So they understand that. And they just went and they just began to worship Jesus. Walk, th walk throughout that, that area, worshiping God, exalting Jesus. Literally, before the children even got back to the camp, within 30 minutes of their leaving, the whole place was raided by the Kenyan equivalent of the FBI, whatever it is. It was instantaneous. Every single one of the ringleaders were caught. They were arrested. The whole operation shut down. The power of, of the simple. So, praise God. Praise the Lord. Except we become like little children. So, Father, I just want to thank you for what you are doing around the earth. Lord, we exalt your name. We say, Lord, we know you're so great. We know that, Lord, that, you are, that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And, Father, we know that not only for Kenya, but we know it for our nations. And Father, we're asking, Lord, that you would begin to give us faith in your undiluted gospel. Lord, we ask that we would read the words in red and say, yes, Lord. We would read the words in black and we would say, yes, Lord. And so, Father, I'm asking right now that you would give us ears to hear what your Holy Spirit is saying to us. Lord, we know that um, you are the vine and we are the branches. We know that without you we can do nothing. And we know that through you we can do all things. And so Father, I'm asking God that you take out, I'm asking you today for an eternal shift. An eternal shift, Lord, that moves us from one place of faith to another for your namesake. Amen. I heard last night that, I said, Pat, what did you do last night? Oh, I just got up there and got drunk. She said, I said, okay, that's good. So you got filled this morning, you got emptied. And now, <laughs> and now we're ready to go, right? And so I actually had another message to preach, and I was praying on the plane yesterday, and uh, the Lord just kind of shifted everything. So um, <clears throat> I, I want to actually talk on Deborah. I believe that arise, Deborah, or awake, Deborah. I got it mixed up, so I put it arise, but awake, no, not that much difference. <laughs> it is a very fitting title for our times. And I hope... And I pray that this is not just words for you. Because I was at a prayer meeting this week with some leaders from our prophetic department. And we were just worshiping and praying. And then out of the corner of my eye, in the spirit, I saw what, was, what looked to me like a warrior angel. And I thought, oh, it's a warrior angel. And the Lord said, no, that's an angel of war. And these are very serious times. This is, these are intense times that call really for Deborah's because Deborah was there in a time of war. And our times are not like happy times necessarily if you walk outside the four walls of this church. I read an article last week, it's something I, I'm always reading somewhere, and I read an article last week that it says that it is very serious when a country faces one major threat at a time. But it went on to say that currently America at this time 
is facing not one, but three major, major threats. And it delineated them. It said the, the threat of impending war with Iraq, that's a big deal. With hopes that a preemptive strike will ward off a more serious threat later on. The second thing it said in the article was the threat of a nuclear attack by Korea. I was watching CNN this morning, and the president of Korea just made this big, um, huge declaration to his country that said, if we go to war with America and engage in nuclear war with America, we will win. That's what he was telling his country. So when people have that kind of mindset or mentality that they're going to win, they're much more likely to go to battle. The third thing that the article mentioned was the threat of global terrorism against Americans everywhere. Now, I'm a Canadian. However, we are, you have a little sister, and that's us. You know, and what happens to you happens to us, so to us it's the great continental we. You know, I mean, we do have a, a distinct boundaries, but likely, you know, if you engage in war, we'll go with you, and vice versa. So... And I just would add a fourth, myself from reading the newspapers on the way here yesterday, that if your country faces a major difficulty, that would be disunity from within. Because you can look in your recent history at the war in Vietnam and know what happens when a country becomes immobilized from the inside out. Now when I say all of this, I am not trying to make political statements. But I am trying to jar the church because the church is supposed to be the lead culture of a nation. God has made us the head and not the tail. And if we are the tail, that is because we have not effectively done our job of being salt and light in our nations. Hence, the book of Judges. Hence, Deborah's. And the book of Judges is all about times such as these. And if you read the book of Judges, you know, I, I love the book of Judges because you'll see that we have such an awesome and all-powerful, ever-living God. We have a God who is the king of every king, that has created every person, that has a name above every name, that if he wants to, he can do anything, but he chooses to do it through his church. And... When you look at God, it's almost like He's so powerful and He's so sovereign, He's so holy and so beautiful that He almost has to weaken Himself and find the weakest vessel to work through in order to accomplish His purposes on earth so that men don't get filled with pride. So I'm on talk today to women who feel weak. And I'm talking today to women who maybe don't feel like they have everything in them to do what needs to be done for your nation. And I'm talking to women today who say that they believe in the, that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Have you ever felt weak? Have you ever felt helpless? Have you ever felt afraid? You're perfect. You're just the type of person God wants to use. You're just the type of judge God will raise up. The Gideons who are freaking out and afraid. The, the, the Ehuds who are left-handed judge. Well, a left-handed judge. You know why, why a left-handed judge was like a, a weakness? Because in battle, you know, you needed, you needed your right hand to go to war. And he was a left-handed judge. Or you had Jethro's son of an, Ill, an illegitimate son. Not even, you know, two parents. I think it says he's the son of a prostitute or just like a single mother anyways. And in, in God, everything that the devil puts against you becomes a power and a strength in your hands. Everything that the enemy would try to use against you, you look through your history, you look through your background, and to God, you take it to God, and you empty yourself of it, and in His hand, it becomes your strongest thing. 
It is where you learn your lessons of life, where you learn the greatness of God and the power of God and just who it is that lives inside you that makes you an overcomer. God is awesome. God is beautiful. God is kind. And in Deborah's situation in particular, <clears throat> It is one of the worst situations in the entire book of Judges. Like, I mean, everyone has bad, you know, bad things attached to it. But in Deborah, when the Lord wanted to raise up Deborah, it says that they were 20 years severely oppressed. I mean, Samson that said they were, you know, overcome by the Philistines for 40 years. But when they were severely oppressed, it was by the Canaanites who were the actual, not an enemy from without, but the enemy from within their own nation, the, one that they, the ones that they hadn't conquered when they went into the promised land. All the other enemies were without, but the Canaanites were within. And the Canaanites had severely oppressed them for 20 years. The enemy was led by a, a leader called Sisera. And the Bible says that he had 900 iron chariots. chariots. Now that's a lot of chariots. And if you look back to chapter 1, it said that the Lord was with Judah and they took possession of the hill country when they're moving into the promised land. But they could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had iron chariots. That's in chapter 1, verse 19. So we know that iron chariots make that enemy so strong, so mighty, so powerful, that it's like, and they're severely oppressed by the ones very close to them, all around them. And here they are, just, just you know, cowering under all these situations. And the Lord raises up two women to take them out. Now, I like that. <laughs> it seems like when the times are the most extreme, God calls on the women. Amen? God calls on the Deborahs not only to awake, it says to arise. It says in verse, you know, 9, it says, then Deborah arose. Deborah got up. Deborah started moving. Deborah just didn't wake up. She actually got up and started going somewhere. As General Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, he said, he said, some of my best men are women. <laughs> and I love that story in the Salvation Army. Actually, my husband's just writing a book with the Salvation Army. Uh, uh, I don't know what you call them, not pastor, whatever they're called, general, something, you know, in their army terms. <clears throat> he has a PhD, and they're writing a book called The, the, the Radical Army about revival and social justice. But I love the illustration from the Sa Salvation Army that, that, you know, when the Salvation Army was about to expand into India, somehow they got news of it ahead of time. And it began to be spread around India that the army is coming, the army is coming. You know, the army is coming, the army is coming. And finally, you know, the boat arrived with the, with the, with the people on it and two small women step off the boat <laughs> and plant a flag on Indian soil and say, for Jesus. You know, because we're in times again where the army is coming. And that army is you. So, let's look into the life of Deborah and let's figure out what it is that she had that caused her to move from a place of severe oppression, from losing the battle, from not being in the place of victory to the place of complete victory. And it says of Deborah, Verse 4, that she was a prophetess who sat under a palm tree. Verse 4 and 5. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of, wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. My mouth is. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, Ephraim, and the sons of Israel came up to her for judgment. Now, Interestingly enough, Deborah was the only one in the entire 
book of Judges spanning almost 500 years that the scriptures say she was not only a judge, she was a prophet or a prophetess. She was the only judge that not only was a judge, but she was a prophetess. That means she could hear the voice of the Lord. She knew the voice of the one that was speaking to her. This is important because I believe in this conference, I believe that this church has sat under a prophetic anointing for years. That the Holy Spirit fell in this church. And when the Holy Spirit fell in this church, what did he birth? He, he said, just like in the book of Acts, he said, now they were filled with the Spirit and they've been, you know, went in like the book of Joel. They will dream dreams. They will see visions. They will prophesy young men, old men. The, the, the manifestation of the filling of the Spirit is that they prophesy. Many of you have sat under a prophetic anointing and had a prophetic impartation and you can now do it. You know how to hear the voice of God. You are the army that God is talking to. It's not somebody else over there. It's not somebody bigger or stronger or slicker. It's the ones that know God. It's the weak. It's the ones that say, well, I don't know. You know, I don't have everything, but I got something. I know how to hear God. Because God is enough. God is enough. In fact, he's more than enough. In fact, when you hear the voice of God, you can do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything that you could ask or think. Because it's about who he is. And the Bible always says that it's the people who know God, the ones that know their God. They're the ones that arise in times such as America is facing. The ones who know their God, who hear his voice, his sheep know his voice, and they go in and they out, out and they find pasture. And at times such as this, it's, the, it's you that is gonna rise up and do exploits right within your very own nation. You don't even have to travel all the way to Africa to do it. Isn't that great? Isn't that awesome? And you are a Deborah movement. And you cannot enter this war without knowing God. Because we are in a war, whether from without or from within. I mean, the kingdom of God has suffered a lot of violence in America. But that's all right. Holy violence is coming back to the church. Deborahs are waking up. And the weapons of... Our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the bringing down of strongholds. And it doesn't matter how long we fought in a battle. The just don't live by what we see, but we live by faith. And so if some of you have maybe been fighting in the abortion battle, killing hundreds and thousands and thousands of babies within your own nation, and you know some people might be even weary of fighting that battle, but I am telling you, the ones who know their God will be strong and do exploits, and they will not quit. Revelations 1 talks about the kingdom and the tribulation and the perseverance which are in Jesus. All of these things are ours in Jesus. The kingdom is ours in Jesus. The tribulation is ours in Jesus. The perseverance is ours in Jesus. And the ones that know God, even in the middle of fire, when they're standing in the middle of a fire in Daniel. They said, if we die, it doesn't matter. Esther said, if I die, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if there's fire. It doesn't matter if there's fig trees. We can overcome temptation. We can overcome sin, sickness, the devil. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is in us. And it's time. It's time for Deborah to arise. You know, it won't be easy. I, I know Jennifer, she didn't tell you this part, but she went to, to the Turkanis Desert. She got malaria and nearly died right before the children's crusade. Right before she led those 600 children into the hospitals and everywhere, she got malaria and nearly died. And I gotta tell you, in my own life, you know, I'm 42. And, um, you know, I, uh, I was called into ministry from the mindset, you have to understand, of Plymouth Brethren with head coverings. And, you know, I went to a Baptist seminary after university for a year, and nowhere in my entire theological grid did I have any understanding of women's ministry. None. Zero. Zip. Nada. Good 
Christian women were submissive at home. I had no aspiration to speak. I had no aspiration to prophesy because I believe that didn't even happen. I had none, none, none of these things. And do you know that when I, and so I was not trained for it. I was not moving for it. I, I, I didn't really care. I just, you know, I, it was not even in my, in my thinking or my mentality. And when God called me into the ministry, let me tell you what the situation of my life was. My oldest child was seven. My fifth child was one month old. We started moving in the ministry uh, around, you know, we went on a three month sabbatical, quote unquote, from our church. It was 1995, the first, you know, month of 1995, February 1995, just the beginning of the second month. And we went on a three month sabbatical with five kids. And we'd never done this before, so we didn't know how to do it. Preaching three times a day, taking the kids, moving every three days, 30 bags. We went all through America. We went down into the States. When we got to the States, you know, my husband's computer broke and he was writing a book, so he had to leave me in an orphanage with the kids to do a conference, all five kids. I mean, I'm nursing the baby in between, you know, um, uh, things. And he left me to do this conference. And the last night of the conference, we had to go into this little Mexican village, you know, 35 people. And I went and I prayed for all 35 people, came home at 2 o'clock in the morning, had to get up at 6 to fly out of Mexico. I'm going to tell you the worst day of my life. This is my, you know, first ministry tip, trip. And we, we had to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I took the kids, and I carried them sleeping into the bus by myself. And, you know, the missionary was there driving me. He was driving me four hours to Guadalajara in this bus. And on the way in the bus, we're driving along the road. About two hours into it, the bus broke down. So the missionary was also a mechanic. And it was the fan belt, so we had a spare fan belt. Can you believe that missionary? I mean, he was a Boy Scout. I mean, how many guys walk around with a spare fan belt? Anyway, he had a spare fan belt. Be prepared. That's the motto of the Boy Scouts, you know, be prepared. So uh, anyway, so he put the fan belt on after about half an hour. And we started driving along again, and all of a sudden the bus goes, choo, 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 and a bus again. Now, he had one spare fan belt, but not two. So what he did was he left me and the five kids in the middle of a Mexican highway with, you know, thoughts of banditos running everywhere. And he hitchhiked back into the next town and left me up there. And it was like beating sun. The sun was beating down. My oldest child, I think, had just turned eight because he was seven when we started. And I think he just turned eight. Anyway, so, and the baby was a couple months old. And um, uh, so I'm sitting in this bus and the sun is beating down. And of course, the children, they don't understand why they have to stay in buses so they don't get run over by cars. They just want out of the bus. So they're begging me to get out of the bus, and I said, no, you can't get out of the bus, but we have to go to the bathroom. So I was trying to keep them off the highway and take them to the bathroom, and, you know, a couple hours later, the, 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 the mechanic comes back, or the missionary comes back. He, pick, he, he With another vehicle, we unpack all 30 bags, put it into the, the, the car, we get to Guadalajara, and I've missed my plane. So he speaks, and he gets me on another plane, because I can't speak Mexican, I mean Spanish, I know not, you know... Spiritu Santos or something. That's about all I know. I don't know very much. And so anyway, he gets me on another plane. And because we'd missed the first plane, I had a very little connection in Mexico City. Now, Mexico City is a big city. It's a big airport. So I get off of the airport, uh, off the airplane in Mexico City, and I'm in the middle of this enormous, enormous airport with five kids, all of whom have rollers, because we were three months on the road, and plus the bags that we have, you know, and plus I've got the baby in the sling. So the kids are all having backpacks and pushing rollers, and we're running through the Mexico City airport. I mean, it was a real surreal scene. The baby is, you know, flinging in the swing, sling, and I went, ah, and, and we hardly made the connection. And, and when we finally got to the place, we just made it by that much, and the kids were all by this time hungry and starving because they were sleeping when they woke up. And so when we got there, I just spent all the rest of my pesos and let them buy anything they wanted, and they wanted candy. I said, fine, candy, fine, it's good enough for me. <laughs> But I wasn't thinking of the long-term effects. So by the time we got on the next plane, on the next plane, you know, I'm exhausted. I had just like done the whole conference. I got this village. I'm, I'm just totally exhausted. And the kids are zing, just wound up. Four boys, you know, and they're just a two-year-old, a four-year-old, a six-year-old, an eight-year-old. They're just like just running up and down the plane, and I didn't care. I thought, what are stewardesses for? You know. 
So I just kind of let them do it. And that plane was so scary. I remember it to this day. It was such a scary plane. It was the worst plane I've ever been on. When it was going off the airport or off the ground, it was like bouncing, you know, bouncing. And, and the whole plane was white knuckling it. And my two-year-old thought it was a ride. So he's, he's laughing hysterically. Ah! It, was, it was just really, it was, you know, a scene out of a movie. But, but finally, I just think, oh, it's going to be okay. Wesley's going to come and save me. It's going to be fine. You know, when I get to Dallas, he'll be there. And when I got to Dallas, he wasn't there. And so I said, that's okay. I'll just wait. I waited 15 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour. And, and, and he didn't show up. And so finally, I thought, like, what if he doesn't come? I'd given all my money away to the orphanage. I had no money. I had a calling card. That's all I had. And I didn't know the pastor's number. So I'm putting a uh, uh, pastor's, uh, pastor's number. So I just phoned 411. And I said, could you please tell me the number of Mr. John Wallace? And the Texan said, well, honey, there's three pages of John Wallace's in the phone book. And that doesn't even touch. Johnny, I, I, I hung up the phone. I hung up the phone. And I burst into tears and I started crying. And then all my kids are going, Mommy, Mommy, what's wrong? I go, nothing. And suddenly, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm just beside myself. I phoned home and tried to find nobody was at home. I couldn't get a hold of anybody. I'm alone in this airport with five kids and, you know, 30 bags. And the kids are, you know, I'm just like, what am I going to do? I, I, I don't even have a credit card. And suddenly over the white phone, uh, over the loudspeaker comes this noise. Would Stacy Campbell please pick up the white phone? And I was crying. I went instantly to fury. I was so mad. I realized, I, I, I realized, you know what? I was crying and suddenly that thing was, Stacy Campbell, please pick up the white phone. And I thought, it's him. <laughs> and he knows where I am. And he left me with five kids in this air niche. And he left me in a couple of, and I'm, by the time I get to that white phone, I am so, I am so angry. It's probably one of the maddest I've been. I'm like stomping to the white phone. I pick up the white phone. I call the number. It's my, you know, and it's the, the pastor's wife. So I had to be nice. <laughs> and so I, I, it's the pastor's wife. And I said, you know, is Wesley Campbell there? And he comes, babe, it's you. And I said, I'm at the airport. Come and pick me up. Click. And that was the best I felt all day. Oh, I was just like, oh, wow. Oh, was, you know. But anyway, then, the, the, you know, and I just thought, like, how could he leave me? And I'm thinking all these thoughts of, of, of abandonment, and I, I couldn't believe that he did that to me. But anyway, then that white phone rings again. That, would Stacey Campbell please pick up the white phone? I said, no, I'm not picking up that white phone. He knows where I am. You know, I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm just filled with righteous indignation about how he could do that to me and leave me. And you know, so the, the I mean, they must have said 30 times, would Stacy Campbell pick up the white phone? I go, no, I'm not picking. I just sat there. The kids are going, Mommy, may, maybe you should pick up the phone. No, I'm not picking up the phone. Anyway, finally, it just went so many times. I picked up the phone. And ladies, ladies. I repented in sackcloth and ashes. I mean, actually what had happened was he had phoned to see where I was because I missed my plane. You know what I mean? He'd actually made the airport planes tell them and that's against airplane policy because I was on the phone, I mean on the plane with five kids and he made them tell me and they guaranteed that I was not on the plane and so therefore they had no ride to come and pick me up and it, the only car that was there had gone to a baseball game, wouldn't be back for two hours so he said, he phoned a pastor that I did not know that lived by the airport to come and sit with me, can you imagine? That had to be nice of that pastor I was just, but anyway that was nice of him uh, it's the, way, the way men think, you know, they just don't get it but, but anyway, that's okay I still remember that nice pastor, you know, I'm, I was not in a very jovial mood, like, and he sat there, I mean, he didn't know what to do, he did, and I was, you know, I didn't even want to talk, but, <laughs> but that's sometimes what it's like, sometimes when you begin to move out, God calls you to do something, you say, God, it can't be true, it can't be now, it can't be me, we have put up all of our excuses, no, 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 and then something bad happens, and then we want to quit. But if we quit before the breakthrough, we've quit too soon. I mean, what if William Wilberforce would have quit before the abolition of slavery? Well, he went bill after bill after bill after bill to the House of Commons to get rid of that. Again and again he was defeated, not once, but twice, several times. He spent an entire lifetime working for the abolition of slavery. 
And there are some of you in this room that just sometimes you just get tired. You've been fighting, you know, for the, for the kingdom of God to come. You've been fighting for, for babies to live. You've been fighting for pornography to be, you know, stopped. You've been fighting for all these things. And it feels like instead of winning, we're losing. But I read lots of verses in the Bible. You know what it says in some of them? It says, for a time, he overpowered them. But, book of Daniel, book of Revelations, and it was given to him to overpower the saints for a certain amount of time. I mean, we really have nothing. I mean, our brothers and sisters in other countries of the world, I, I heard a story of, of, of the Sudanese, our Sudanese brothers and sisters, and you know what? This is what I heard a testimony from one of them, speaking to the Saudi Arabian Christians in an underground church. He said to the Saudi Arabians, you know what we did in the Sudan? We broke the fear barrier. Over two million Christians martyred in the Sudan. They broke the fear barrier. The last enemy to be overcome is death. And some of you are called not only to hear the voice of God, but do something about it. Deborah heard, Deborah acted. Deborah listened to what the Lord commanded, called the people around her, said, this is what the Lord said, and this is what we're supposed to do. And then she acted, and she sent out people into battle, a real battle. I mean, I, 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 we don't have a TV at our house, so when I go into airports, I always like to watch CNN. You know, I heard, I heard a guy yesterday in Connecticut, he, uh, rural Connecticut, you know how you guys are buying duct tape and, and, and stuff like that to seal your, and, and that plastic stuff? Well, this guy, you know, took it to another level. He got all that plastic stuff, and he wrapped his entire house in it in rural Connecticut. I mean, plastic bubbles can only keep us for so long. <laughs> plastic bubbles. Our answer is not in plastic bubbles and duct tape. Our answer is in knowing God, hearing Him, and doing it. Doing it in season and out of season, when you're the only one there doing it or whether you're not. Something is better than nothing. You know, like that old story of, you know, that person, the tide went out and all these starfish were stranded on the shore. And, and this one old man was out there, you know, throwing the starfish back in, but there was hundreds and hundreds of starfish. And somebody comes along and says, old man, you're never going to finish that. You're never going to get all those starfish back in the ocean. Why do you, what are you, what are you doing that for? And he says, that's never going to help. The old man picked up another starfish and threw it back in. He said, well, it helped that one. And I live by the philosophy, something is better than nothing. And I'm, I, am, I am a chicken. I'm standing up here as I know I'm a chicken. I know I, am, I know who I am. I know who I am when I'm alone with God in a room. I know who I am. I am not a strong person. God is always asking me to do things that are exceedingly above everything that I can ask or think. God always chooses the most inopportune times. It's never a good time for me. I never feel strong enough. I never feel full of faith enough. I look at other people, I go, wow, you know that Pat, you know, she's just amazing. I don't have the fruit of the Spirit that she does. Something bad happens to me, I get mad. <laughs> I'd be angry and sin. Not. <laughs> but you know, it's time that we seize the day. Two women took out an army with 900 chariots. <laughs> Two women. One woman, she had all the strategies. She heard from God. She sat under the palm tree. The other woman just happened to be in the right place at the right time. She maybe didn't have all the strategies. I feel actually more like JL than I feel like Deborah. I'm, I'm, like, I'm just 
just kind of bumbling along through life trying to keep the kids fed and clothed, you know? <laughs> trying to remember their birthdays. <laughs> yeah, but, but JL, JL, she just like, she, she was there, sister arrived, she said, come on in, she gave him some milk, goat's milk, I think, and then she took what was in her hand, she didn't even have a fancy weapon, she didn't have all the army that all the guys had that were out going to war, she had none of that, she had a little tent peg and a hammer, Maxwell said, we have that reminder of that song or something. <laughs> you can tell how old I am. I'm 42 just for you if you want to know. But anyway, and the thing is that JL maybe didn't have all the strategy that Deborah had, but she had something. And all through the Bible it says this, what is in your hand? What is in your hand? Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Whatever, you know, to seize the moment. Today is sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Let's just do something today. Let's just do something now. Because something surely is better than nothing when it comes from the spirit of the living God, the creator of the universe that lives inside us. Wow! Eternal God doing eternal works for an eternal purpose. And the things that I do today, by the grace of God, they will not have just a day's effect. They will have an eternal effect. And they will go not only for one generation, but by the grace of God, if I live my life in such a way, the blessings that the Lord will give to me will go by covenant to the third and fourth generation. And I'm asking for all the generations until he comes. But it takes faith. It takes us to move not in the knowledge of who we are. We all know who we are. You know who you are. I know who I am, but the good thing is it's not about us, it's about him. Some of you will be graced by God to think like Debris. You know what you're called to, you're moving toward it, so you're already walking out in vision and destiny. This is the grace of God to just sit and hear what he is. I mean, I was at, I lead a, um, just leading a little group for a couple months, a uh, prophetic group to teach them how to prophesy at our youth conference so that the youth are prophesying to youth. And uh, I had this little group on Friday at my house. And at the end, we sat around and had tea. And one young man, he's in grade 12, I said, so what are you going to do? He said, well, first I'm going to uh, go to university for 13 years and become a neurosurgeon. And after that, he said, that's going to be my way to finance my way to become prime minister. All right. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> Not bad. But I like it when they think big. The other 15-year-old said, well, I'm not really sure what to do, but she said, I know I want to preach. I know I love to preach. So she said, I'm just taking every opportunity I can get to preach. I preached at our Christian club, and she gave me her whole sermon. She said, I just want to travel all over the world and preach the gospel. Woohoo! Woohoo! 15! I said, all right. I mean, Jennifer, Jennifer is taking a generation to a nation. I mean, we, we got to start thinking big. How big is your God? Is your God the king, the creator of the entire universe? Not just the earth, but the sun, the moon, the stars. How big is your God and he is in you? And that's some of you, like JL, you don't have a clue what you're called to. I mean, you're living in the season of childbearing, you know, homeschooling or whatever, working in the day, you're in the day shift, you're on the night shift, you know, I got sleepless nights, you're, you know, I've had nights where all five of my kids have got sick at the same time, but no, actually not at the same time, one at one o'clock, one at two o'clock, one at three o'clock, <laughs> one at four o'clock, and you know, thinking about a future vision is a little bit daunting, that doesn't matter what's in your hand, you got a spiritual tent peg, you can bring down strongholds in your home, in your city, in your nation, in your neighborhood. You can do it because God is in you and he has given you weapons of warfare that are not carnal, but they're mighty through him to pull down those strongholds, pull down that unbelief, pull down that, that, that whatever that is in your neighborhood or your house. God is in you and he can pull it down and he has given you weapons to pull it down because the kingdom of God has suffered violence and it's time that the violent rose up to take it back by force. Oh, wake up, Deborah. Wake up. And this is not for 
God, this is, this is for all of us. If, can you imagine if 1,000 or 1,200 or 1,500 women actually believed that? Can you imagine if they walked out of this building and into their home and they suddenly believed that their weakness was God's strength and they suddenly started fixing their eyes on Jesus and they suddenly stopped looking at all the obstacles behind them in their history, ahead around them in their families, ahead of them in their futures and they began to fix their eyes on God and they began to declare the name of Jesus over that history, declare the power of the blood of Christ around their surroundings, declare the power of the blood of Christ into their future, into their neighborhoods. Can you imagine if 1,000 women really believe that? Woo we, we have it here, two women took out a nation with the help of a few men in the book of Judges. What can a thousand women do hand in hand with the men of God? And so, as Daffy Duck used to say on Bugs Bunny, I think it was Daffy Duck, I guess you know this means war. Maybe it was Bugs Bunny. I guess you know, this means war. Whether or not Iraq ever happens, we are in a war. But we really are in a crisis in North America. In fact, one article I read in the newspaper some place said that America is reaping what it has sown in the sense that America actually trained bin Laden America didn't, you know, kind of went part way in Iraq last time, this is what the article said, and part way in South Korea for North Korea, you know, not really fulfilling the whole thing, just doing a part but not the whole. And when the world retreats in fear, it's time for the just who live by faith to rise up. 21 people were killed in a nightclub last night. Why? Because 1,500 people were afraid. What about if a 1,000 women were full of faith? In season and out of season. In famine, in war. You know, Jesus, the last word he ever said to his disciples was, in this world you will have tribulation. But don't sweat it. I've overcome the world. And when we know God, it doesn't matter what our external is like because our internal is absolutely secure all the time. In the fire, out of the fire. You know, have you not read Hebrews 11? All the way through all these trials and even the but others. It's God, it's God, it's God, it's God. How much faith do we have in God? It is Him and Him alone that can help us in times like this. And when we lower our trust to governments or to bubble wrap, you know what I mean? And I want to say that there's really good news. I've read the end of the book. It's terrible. There's seals in there that get busted open. There's, you know, trumpets, there's judgments. It's just like one big book of judgment from beginning to end, blood in the sea, blood everywhere. There's, it's, just a, it's just a mess. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Yeah. Woohoo! He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. And we're going to go one day meet him in the air, in the clouds, and we're coming too. And I want to put on a um, prophetic word that the Lord gave me on one of the prayer CDs with Lou Engel. It's got a little video clip with it. So you can look up there and you can just listen.
Lord Jesus went to the cross, he said these words to his disciples. I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming and he has no hold on me. But the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what the Father has commanded me. And he knew what was coming and said, I am sending you out as sheep amongst wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. And he told them not to be afraid. Do not be afraid of him who can kill the body, he said. But rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And he told me to tell you that he knows what is coming. That he knows what is coming. That he knows the days that are ahead of you. And he is raising up martyrs again. Many who will go out and who will shed their blood as he shed his blood. But he said to comfort them with these words. Tell them, I know what is coming. Do not be afraid. again and he is rising with all the fury that is in him and he is out to destroy everything that I have created both the land and the sea and the universe and the people and he is coming with all the fury of hell for destruction for he comes to kill to steal and to destroy Tell my disciples not to be afraid. For before he does it, I know what is coming. And I am sending them out like sheep among wolves. And the power that is in them is greater than the power that is in him. And as they go out fearless, they will overcome him. In this world they will have tribulation, but they are not to be afraid, for I have overcome the world. And through them, I will continue to overcome the world. And I will do it one by one, person by person, soul by soul. I will overcome all of his schemes and all of his plans, for the prince of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. There's nothing in me. Blood of the Lamb, overcoming it all. 
destruction, blood, into a sign of victory, blood! And the world will see that I have loved my father, and the world will see that they have loved me. Loving not their lives unto death, the world will see. Those scenes of um, hundreds of thousands of people, I think there was a million or two, was of a Reinhardt Bonnke crusade in Africa. And I read my kids the biography of Reinhard Bonnke, and at the end of it, my son, who was six or, th or seven at the time, said, Mom, if Reinhard doesn't finish saving Africa by the time he dies, maybe I could finish it off for him. But we could say that for our own country. Maybe we could finish it off. And the Lord has been speaking to me very strongly about a shift in the body of Christ. That there was a season where he brought us into the church and he brought the world into the church to love them, to heal them, and to free them, to fill them with wine, to pour solve on their wounds but the next season is the shift that the greater anointing is going to fall on that same healed army that moves out into the world and the greater anointing is going to be on those ones that are in you know not the lost coming into the church but the church going into the world and that's the pattern of the disciples. First he walks with us. Then he comes with us. You know what I mean? And then he sends us out. It's time to go out. And I have to tell you that it's not easy. It's not easy for any of us. We all get in church mindsets. I remember when the Lord asked me to go out and start prophesying out and do these little booster juices and I talked to Pat and we did these things. I mean, I was scared. I stood up in front of the team of people I was training and said, I'm your fearless leader. I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing. And you know that the lost lined up for five and six hours to receive prophecies from the church? And they're so hungry. I was talking to a guy that, from the Institute of Global Affairs and he said that, the, that the, 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 the marker for the last century in global affairs and in the global gates was finance and finance and was the, 
was the indicator of wealth. I mean, it was the indicator of power, he said. But now the leaders of the world are so bankrupt. Every single leader, they don't know answers and they come into rooms and they try to think up with all their intellect and with all their education, they're trying to think up answers, but the world's problems are so big that they don't have any answers. And he said that the answer for the next century is spirituality. And they're bringing Hindu gurus, gurus into the UN because all these intellectuals, they don't have any idea how to solve the world's problems, but we do. So let's get out there and let's get going. And I just feel like, uh, Pat, I want to invite you up here. And Lila, anybody else who has something. But what I want to do is I want to pray for an impartation of faith to go. Of Deborahs who will rise up, who will wake up, get up, and move on. Because every single one of you is a Deborah. Because God is in you. It's not like in the Old Testament where his spirit would only fall on a few and he had to find the weakest ones. Well, now he's got us. And his spirit is in us. The spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead knows how to take a household. Knows how to take a neighborhood. Knows how to take a city. Knows how to take a nation. Right, Heidi? Right? Jennifer, and how old do you have to be to do it? Seven or eight? Anybody older than seven or eight here? I want to call you up here and I want to pray. And I actually had a, a, a few prophetic words that I just wanted to share. Do you have something you want to share first? A corporate thing? Are you sure? You can go move into it in a minute. But Heidi, um, I, I sat beside you and... I just looked over at you in the worship and I just, actually I started to cry. I just looked at you and started to cry. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, Heidi, my little Heidi. And that's when I started weeping, when I saw that you were the Lord's little Heidi. And that he just said to me, he said, her very weakness is her strength. Her very littleness before me her very humility in my presence when she comes empty every time again and again emptying herself and I saw that you emptied yourself on purpose before the Spirit of the Lord that you did not come full and when you did come full you emptied yourself like Jesus he emptied himself and took on himself the form of a bond slave and I see you emptying yourself Whenever the enemy tries to fill you with thoughts of pride. And because of that, you can be moved, used again and again and again. And the Lord said to me, he said, you're working on one nation. But I see surrounding nations. I see many nations in Africa where the Lord is raising you up as a prototype. And what you are do doing in Mozambique is not finished yet. But I see spheres of influence going into the surrounding nations. And God is going to give you a prototype just like he gave Reinhard Bonnke for the continent. And not only for that continent, think big, Heidi, for the continent of Asia and continent of Latin America. Begin to think, how big is your God? Because you know me in weakness, so you will know my strength. And I believe that just um, like Mother Teresa, there's something that you've captured on little things. And big God that will allow you to do a shift in several continents of the world. And Brenda, I saw that, that you are a Deborah, that you have strategies, that the Lord has given you strategies, and I see like a, a fearlessness moving on you, and I see that God has actually overcome in several areas of your life to move you into this fearlessness and to this boldness. But you have a calling that's so different because God has called you to the church and for the church. And God is going to use you like a John the Baptist to prepare the way. And I see Pharisees all around you. I see a whole a spirit, a Pharisee spirit, a Sadducee spirit that comes. But God has given you a mighty disarmament of that spirit that you just move in and you just be who you are and the power of God is in you and it's greater than the power that is in them 
and I see you shifting and God has called you to continue to prepare the way for the church and I see even more churches ahead of you and, and there's something in the area of the church where you're just disarming and disarming and disarming and God has given you faith for even very hardened what I would say church spirits you know religious spirits even the most hardened of church spirits, God will send you into places and you're just going to be quaking in your boots going, oh, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? They don't even like this. They don't even like me. But, 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 um, but God is going to use you not only to disarm, but to show the power of his beautiful Holy Spirit. Of his beautiful Holy Spirit. So Lord, stir this gift that is in her. Stir the prophetic anointing that is on her life. And you're going to prophesy more, Deborah. You're going to prophesy and prophesy and prophesy and prophesy till the kingdom of God begins to fill this earth. Shh, 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 shh. And be bold because there's still, I see uh, in many nations, and I know you've already traveled to many nations, but I see that, that, that this itinerant thing is on you to go and refresh other places. And, and even... Wow, so Lord, I just bless that. And Father, I, I even see, Lord, uh, sometimes the Lord has called Wes and I to divide and conquer. You know what I mean? To just uh, take two anointings from and, 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 and do it. And I see that that same thing is on your life, that your husband is going to do a certain thing, but you are going to do another. And there's more of a translocal call on your life. God is going to take you into more places and take you to do it. And you are going to be a shifter, Deborah, a shifter, not just to raise up the women, but also to call a man into battle. Amen. We're just going to, um, we believe the Holy Spirit is moving powerfully, especially um, in response to the word that was preached earlier. And um, I know that many of you are feeling an igniting on the inside of you saying, yes, I will arise, I will arise. And uh, we want to just release um, a, a corporate blessing over you. And Jennifer, can you come up too? And, and Brenda, why don't you come up? And Lila, uh, because we'll do this together. Diane, come on up. Um, you know, um, this message was so powerful, and I'd just like to say something before we pray and release um, an empowerment onto you, is that, you know, a lot of times we look to a certain image or structure or something to facilitate the move of God, but, you know, the Lord's just looking for a willing heart, and He's just looking, you know, sometimes we just, we just miss everything that God's wanting to do because we're looking for something spectacular when He's got it right in front of us. It's like Jesus, you know, the nation and all the religious leaders and the religious people of the day, they were looking for something spectacular according to their own vision, but the spectacular was found in a manger. It was found in the humble. It was found in the little. And um, I believe that God is going to release you as women to be conquerors, to go and to take the kingdom of God and to spread the fire of the gospel. And it, and it might seem just like in little things, maybe in the workplace or in the home with your children and their, and their children's friends and, and um, all of that it might seem like in little ways, but it's going to ignite a nation because Jesus is in those things. And some of you are feeling like real little people. You're feeling like you're insignificant but you have something in your hand and the Lord has need of you and you know you heard Jennifer's testimony she's 23 years old just turned 23 we shared a little bit about Todd last night just 27 years old you know Stacy sharing her whole situation being a housewife and raising five children and, and 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 not even looking as though there's even time to do the work of the ministry and yet God and yet God and yet God how big is your God? And he's able to do anything with anyone at any time. It doesn't matter what age you are. Jennifer shared about little children, little children closing down hospitals for the glory of God. No sick to be found to put in the hospitals. This is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is at hand in this nation also. But God's looking for the Deborahs to arise. And so, if you're stirred within your heart, if you're stirred within your heart, why don't you stand right now? And we're going to release um, a prophetic um, ordination, so to speak, of a releasing of you with what God's put in you, with what God's put in your life, with, with, with who he's made you to be, to be released and to go in the power and the authority of his name. And we're just going to stand together as a representation of weak women, but strong in the Lord. 
We all have a story to tell. We're not standing up here as, as superheroes or people that have it together. We're standing here in weakness, in the strength of a great God. You heard about Heidi and she, how she's, she's being used to save a whole nation and nations around her. It's, is she a strong, mighty person? Even in stature, she's small. But she serves a big, big, big God. And she's a Deborah that has arisen. And you can arise too. And so um, we're just going to begin to pray for you. We're going to um, represent. We're just going to represent women. We're standing together, linking arm in arm on your behalf to say, yes, we believe that, that the God that we serve can release, ignite, empower, anoint, and impart to you a releasing authority today to go and do the works of the kingdom. Stacy, do you want to pray the blessing? So, Father, we just say freely we have received. Everything we have is from you, and freely we have received it. Totally free, so, Lord, freely we give. And, Father, it is not enough for us to go to heaven alone. Not one of us in this room. It's not enough for us to go to heaven alone. But, Lord, you are so worthy. You are so worthy, Lord. You deserve nations and continents. And so, Father, we pray an impartation of what we have received, Lord, that it would go on to them, Lord, that they would begin to prophesy more, that they would go into their homes with the word of the Lord and change things and shift it. Lord, we pray for a shift, that there would be no more fear but faith on who God is in them, <laughs> that nothing is impossible to those who believe. And I'm asking you, God, that you would put an impartation of faith so that it is worked out in action, Lord. That not long beyond this conference, far beyond this conference, we're asking, God, for your eternal word to go forth and bring eternal fruit. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And you know, I just saw a, a, a dispatching of angels into this room right now. And many of you identified with having bubble wrapped wrap all around you. It's like you have bubble wrap around you. And you said, Lord, I've been trying to protect myself. And it's like the Lord's dispatch angels to, to, to unwrap the bubble wrap. And so you can just emerge. And so if that's you, just lean into what God's doing and begin to shake off the bubble wrap. Just do it as a prophetic movement and shake it off, Lord, whatever that has been, whatever whatever has been around me that I've been trying to protect myself and, and have all that stuff stuck on me. And Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, we just break the power. We break the power of the women. We break the power of the bubble wrap. No more bubble wrap. We have God wrap, God wrap, God wrap. We're wrapped and clothed in the righteousness and the authority of Jesus Christ today. Whoa. 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 Arise, Deborahs, arise. Whoa. 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 There's a, um, a, a woman that was the Korean pastor. I, I forget your name, but, but um, the Lord um, has his hand on you, and there's going to be like a whole shifting of the way that you've been doing things in church. And um, that you're a woman of prayer and you're a woman who calls out to God. You're a woman who cries out for the depth of the heart of God. And the Lord says that as you continue to cry out, he's going to give you a pattern. He gave Moses a pattern for the tabernacle. He says, build it according to the pattern. But there's a pattern coming to your heart concerning a certain mandate or a, a, an assignment that God is going to put into your hand. And you're going to go and you will be like a Deborah, but you're also going to be like a jail and so um lord i just release that anointing on her right now in jesus name amen can we give the lord a clap offering can we finish in praise and celebrate him again shouting the praises of god let you shout his praise let's shout his praise ladies let's shout his praise let's release this let's release the power of his name let's glorify his name let's lift up his name jesus King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus, God of war, Jesus, our strength and our salvation. I think that the biggest tactic of the enemy has been to convince us, the church, that we are not who we are. And see, if we know who we are, then we're dangerous. If you understand truly your identity, 
in Christ, with God inside of you, the, the kingdom of God inside of you, if you truly understand that, you're a complete threat to the enemy. And the enemy has tried to come with fear and bring fear to us and paralyze us so that we don't move out with that. And um, what I believe we're doing today is we're breaking off fear. And I believe that God is posing us with a, a question, choose faith or choose fear. And you know, it was just over a year ago when I, God taught me this lesson, choose faith, choose fear. I had five men breaking in my room to rape and kill me. And in the moment of total fear, you don't even know how not to choose fear. And that's what's coming. Without God, you'll just be consumed with fear. And even some of you, I believe, probably as that video was playing, instead of being stirred in faith, you're actually feeling fear of what's coming. And we want to take authority over that, um, over that spirit of fear, because that is the very thing that will, that will hold us back. But I'm telling you, if we take authority over that thing and we say, you know what, even though I have no idea, God, how you're going to get me out of this situation, I choose to believe. I have faith, and I'm going to stand on it. And guaranteed, time and time again, you will see the victory of God in your life. So maybe we can just pray out a prayer of... So, and Jesus, you know, actually, first of all, if you're really struggling with fear, just put up your hands. Let's just surrender this to the Lord. Let's just start by repenting. Lord, we repent of fear, God. Lord, we say we're so sorry, Lord, for times that we haven't trusted in you, God, and who you say that we are, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for not believing, God, for giving into that spirit of fear. And Lord, we are tired of living defeated. And we are not going to be bound the lies of the enemy about who we are anymore. We're going to step out, Father, in who you say we are from this day forward. Lord, forgive us. And so right now, in Jesus' name, corporately, we take authority over the spirit of fear that has bound the body of Christ. And we say, no more. No more in Jesus' name. We crush it under our feet. We are not going to be bound to fear. We are not going to be worried. We are not going to be bound to fear anymore in Jesus' name. Lord, I release a spirit of faith that in the time of crisis, Lord, when you come to us and you say, choose faith or choose fear, your life depends on it. Choose faith, choose fear, Lord, that we can choose faith. That we will not be afraid. We will not be afraid, Lord. Give us eyes to see, Lord. Dove's eyes to see, God. To glare right into your eyes, Lord. And to never be moved with the things happening around us, Lord. Father, we worship you for you are very great, Lord. You are great, and we will have victory in you, Lord, and there's nothing to fear. We thank you, Lord. We exalt you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Um, praise the Lord. When the, um, the morning that our president, the United States, declared that we were going to go to war, we were having a service that morning. And the Holy Spirit came over the whole congregation, and we began to intercede. And the thing that the Lord spoke to me then, and I believe it's appropriate to bring it out right now, is the enemy is out to destroy the royal seed. As uh, Ataliah, which, who was a very evil woman, was out to destroy all of her children and grandchildren and all that so that she could rule, that, that it's that same spirit. But it was a simple uh, woman and her husband that were priests, intercessors, that hid that child until he was brought into his authority. And I believe that's what this whole thing's all about. I have two grandsons that are in, in uh, the Middle East right now. And I know that if we thought about that, it, fear would grip us. But God has called us. If nothing else will move you today, Think about your seed. It's the third, the fourth, to a thousand generations should Jesus tarry. But our seed is going to be victorious. And this is a war for eternity. This is a war for generations. And so I just ask right now, Jesus, every mother's heart here, every grandmother's heart here, every woman, Lord, that we would let that spirit of Ataliah, the, the offspring of, of Jezebel, that that would be destroyed in every single woman here, that selfish thing that would want to exalt them, that they would sit on the throne and that they would rule. And God, I ask that that would be broken today. And Lord, let the spirit of the priest and the intercessor hide those 
hide them in the temple, O oh God, until the time of the coming out of these children. And Lord, we declare that our generations, yes, our, our seed shall continue on in righteousness. The royal seed shall be victorious because we have been called for such a time as this to bombard heaven, oh, for our royal seed. Just begin to call out the name of your children, your grandchildren, whether they're serving the Lord or whether they're not, they're royal seed, destined, destined right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I call out the name of all of my children, every one of them. Oh God, for Bobby and for Tracy and for Robin and for, oh, for Rhonda and for their husbands and their wives and my grandchildren, oh God. Oh, for Jeremy and Robbie and, oh, Jessica and Heather. Oh, and Ski and John, oh God. I call out my grand, my great grandchildren. Yes, oh God, for Trey. Oh, oh, oh. yes, 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 yes. Oh, yeah, for Mariah. Oh, Alexi, oh God. Oh, may they be hidden in the temple. May they be surrounded with the temple of prayer, oh God. May we become houses of salvation, not only for our families, but for the royal seed internationally, oh God. Royal seed preserved. Kings, priests. Yes, Lord. Rally us. Give us vision. Rip the veil of religion off of our eyes to see that this is a battle to the gate. I hear the Lord saying that we have remembered the cost and forgotten the cause and that God is wanting to raise us up to not look at the cost but to look at the cause and in Hebrews it tells us that Jesus for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame but he looked forward to salvation and that was the thing that made him go through the cross was because he had he had had a greater purpose on the other side of the cross than he did on this side of the cross so god says forget the cost and get your mind on the cause because the cause is the loss of the nations of all the world and god is calling us into intercession and in prayer and into humility before him that he may be seen because when God sees you and God sees us, he doesn't see us as big, but he sees us as vessels. But when God, when you begin to see God and you begin to think of a little God, you're not capable of going to war. But when you know that God is empowering you, you can rise up because God can be seen when you're nothing. Then God is there. And he's waiting for you to back off so his glory might be manifest and go forward in the kingdom of God. Oh, Jesus. Loose us today, Lord, into a spirit, a spirit, Lord, of, of, of total giving. Total giving of ourselves. Lord, not allowing little things that come to stop us, not allowing little things that appear to, to discourage, but be encouraged, says the Lord. Lift up your head and be encouraged and walk with confidence, but you are king's kids, and God has given you the victory through Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Well, ladies, I want you to know that I was like the little girl in the book, Hind's Feet in High Places. Her name was Much Afraid. And the good shepherd wanted to take her to the high places with him. 
And he had to use things, those people around her, the murmurs and complainers and all her circumstances to get her to move to the place where he had for her. And sometimes the trials that you've been going through and you, you think they've been so overwhelming at times. Did you know that was God? That God was trying to bring you out of complacency to press into him, to look to him for every answer. He has all our answers. But many of you have been hiding out in your tent like J.L. Now, Deborah was a wife. She knew what it was to live in a tent with a husband. Doesn't say anything about her having children, although God gave her spiritual children. But I believe there was a day when God watched her in the tent, saw her faithfulness. She was given an entrustment because of the way she acted. An entrustment to lead a nation. God's looking for faithful women. And I am a type of Deborah that God, I was a jail that came out of her tent, not knowing what God had for me in my life. I would have put money on it that he couldn't use me. I was happy to be a pastor's wife sitting on the pew, never liked the pulpit, hated it, was so self-conscious and full of pride. I didn't want anybody to see that I wasn't a good speaker or I couldn't do this or couldn't do that. So I stayed low in the background, not leading my women like I should have. And I'm sorry for that. But God saw my heart and took and broke all the bondage off of me and set me free. And now I can dwell under a palm tree of gladness. Amen. And he's got that for you too, ladies. But you've got to come out of being enamored with yourself and your problems. And you know, when God touched me, I had begged him for years. I said, God, if you'll touch me, I'll tell women of what you did. I knew that I did not have the joy that the word spoke about. You know, I was just so bound in my mind and tormented and just fearful just such fear. But when God touched me, I went to Toronto and was totally touched. It was two weeks later when I came home, I noticed that that claw in my brain was just gone. I was free. And I was so thankful to the Lord. And I had such tears of gratitude. All I could do was worship and tears. I'm telling you, the love was so deep, there was no words that could be spoken between him and me. It was just tears of gratitude that he had fixed me. Now, my husband would have if he could have. You know how they want to help us. But God did it. You know why? Because I tried within myself to be perfect and to be the perfect one, and I couldn't. And he stepped in, he said, let me do it. And when he did, just the intimacy that came four months before revival, four months before revival, I was alone with God. He would wake me early in the morning. I'd always prayed and fasted and read my word, loved the word, but it was different now. I began to have intimacy with him. I never knew you could really have that kind of relationship with the Lord. And it was so wonderful, but I'm telling you, it became contagious. When God touched me, it touched my husband. When he saw the change that came over me, and you know, the Lord spoke to me. This is really how the Deborah started in my heart, was I was reading Judges, and I was reading about Deborah. And in my son room, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, Deborah, and Barak must be one and work together. And you know, God has, is raising up women today, and you've heard these powerful preachers already. 
And we have acted in such ways with men that it's turned men off. We lose, lose our femininity when we get up and speak, and we become mannish, and it just totally turns men off. But God's given us a, a chance again to come and stand shoulder to shoulder with our husbands in ministry, with pastors and intercessors working together and everybody just doing what's right and 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 just being submissive to our our husbands being submissive to our pastors not thinking you can do a better job just humbling ourselves staying in our place you see god had already spoke to barrick but deborah had influence to go and talk to him. She didn't lord it over him. She just reminded him, has God not said? And you know, that's what's going to happen. When God awakened my heart, my husband rose up. God will awaken the Deborahs when they get in their rightful place. Do what's right. God will awaken you, and then the barracks are going to rise up and take their place. They're going to be so excited. I just want to release that today, that you will get it in your rightful place. This is an army that God is raising up of women. If you've got sin in your life, just stop it. I love what one of the speakers said, just quit it. Get in your rightful place. It's your place. Don't let anybody else take your place. God's called you. You're here because you're hungry. You've probably got some problems, but God is going to take care of that before you leave. By faith, I speak that. So let's all just get shoulder to shoulder like we did the other night. Jesse, come back to the piano. I like this. You know, I think it's in Ireland that it's called heart dance. Uh, what's it called? River dance, remember that? Well, this is the river dance, girl. Yeah. Is Jesse here? Uh, anybody play the piano? <laughs> wow. I don't know. You see these powerful women of God, but you heard them. They're all scared. They're all scared. And you know, you got to keep trying. You got to press in. I'm scared to death when I first started and speaking. And there's many people that are, you know, PhD degrees and all this stuff. I haven't got anything like that. But I do have Jesus. And, you know, it's because I keep trying that I get a little better. Maybe I'm getting a little better. <laughs> but I keep trying because I won't let the devil hold me back anymore. And ladies, I'm just a simple person, but you know, God takes simple people. He takes the unlearned and he uses them. You know, Paul was very learned and he puts him over here to the Gentiles and he, you know, the, the they wouldn't receive anything but signs and wonders. They didn't want to hear about all his religious rules. But then he takes an unlearned Peter and he puts him over here in the camp of all the wise men, you know, the, the Israelites. They're very brilliant and smart. And it was to confound the wise. God loves to do things. He loves foolish things. Are you a foolish thing? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> She's not Jesse, but she'll do. <laughs> Well, Father, right now, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you've given us to, to just speak to the Deborahs, Lord. They're your heart, Lord. And I pray today, Lord, as we march before you, that, Lord, that our hearts will be in sync with you, Lord, that our footsteps will travel where you want us to go. And, Lord, by faith, I'm speaking, Lord, that the fear will fall off today in the name of Jesus that they will say yes to you. No more will they stay in their tent, but they will come out and invite the enemy in and then take care of the enemy. Go to the enemy's camp, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you want to do for these ladies. And we say to them, Deborahs, awake and rise up. Take your place in his army. 
in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, hallelujah. Get us a fast song, a stomping song, amen.